Okay, well, thank you very much for having me, uh, Kimberly. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to uh, some of the teachers out there in uh, Southern California. So here are my talking points uh, for my presentation. Uh, this is the agenda. I'll start my uh, STEM story by talking about what inspired me initially, what excites me today, and what my career tra trajectory has been uh, to get to my current position. I will then discuss my work and research in a little more detail, including environmental sciences, sustainability, and bio-inspired design. Next, I will describe the STEM skills and knowledge your students will need to be successful in my career field. I will touch on what teachers can do to support students interested in my career field or interested in Lockheed Martin. Finally, I will describe some of the many resources we have to support teachers as well as STEM outreach programs we have for students and teachers to explore research in my STEM field. For example, we support schools with virtual classroom speakers. We have STEM education programs. We do virtual job shadowing and are involved in a, a number of STEM outreach events. So does this make sense? This is um, exactly what I was asked to present. So hopefully understanding that quality means 100% conformance to requirements that this should be a quality presentation. So I will start off with my STEM story. So my STEM story begins with a, a lower middle class kid growing up in the 60s and 70s in Colton, California, the so-called hub city in the heart of the Inland Empire of Southern California, who, who became aware of the pollution problem as a sophomore in high school and in a couple of different ways. First, I played four years of high school football and I can remember experiencing very painful and difficulty breathing during hell week at the end of summer, uh, getting ready for football season because of the smog, which was especially bad in my area due to the mountains, which tend to box in uh, the smog in uh, the Inland Empire. Second, uh, I can remember talking about the first Earth Day and the ecology movement in some of my classes uh, when I was in high school. It was then, about 1970, that I decided to pursue a career that would focus on fighting pollution. After high school, I attended UCR, UC Riverside, and majored in environmental sciences which was one of the very first universities to offer such degree. With strong roots in ag science, UCR researchers were the first to study pesticide and smog impacts on plants. And so eventually the statewide air pollution research center was located at UCR and Dr. James Pitts uh, led that center. Uh, uh, and you can see Dr. Pitts uh, in the upper left photo uh, showing then Governor Ronald Reagan what smog does to the lungs. My professor, Dr. Pitts, was the first to figure out how smog is formed in the atmosphere. And then uh, much later in my career, I received a master's degree in environmental and occupational uh, health from uh, Cal State University Northridge. I feel blessed to have been able to both start and end my career doing what I like best, and that is applied research in the environmental field. I have 42 years of experience in the environmental field and started out my career working for TRW as a chemist in their environmental laboratory and then moved to uh, become a field technician where I worked on projects for US Environmental Protection Agency to identify and evaluate the types of air pollutant emittance from steel foundries, power plants, and copper smelters. The top left picture is a picture that I took while at Kaiser Steel in Fontana while we were sampling for benzene emissions from their Coke ovens. The picture below that is the one I took while at TRW's lab in 1979. 
I then moved to a technical staff position, writing reports on the fate and transport of pollutants and pesticides in the air, water, and soil for US EPA. Key lessons learned for me at TRW were how to write a good research paper and technical report and how to carefully follow analytical methods. Then I got a job as an environmental control specialist working for Lockheed Aircraft Service Company in Ontario. Some of my most important learn, uh, learn by doing occurred there. And that's, you can see me there on the bottom right photo trying to identify various hazardous wastes that were left out in drums on the wash rack for many years before I got there. Also had a lot more hair back then too. <laughs> Key lessons learned for me at Lockheed Aircraft Service Company included the value of well-written procedures, training and cost accountability, as well as working with shop floor employees. I got my first manager position at General Dynamics Space Systems in San Diego, which is now part of Lockheed Martin. And that's me in the upper right photo at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, uh, Space Launch Complex number 36. The key takeaway while at General Dynamics was learning the value of senior management leadership and support. From there, I went to work for Allied Signals Aerospace Headquarters in Torrance, California, where I was responsible for managing the environmental program for 26 divisions of the company at over 100 factory locations around the world. This was the shortest position I've ever held, getting burned out from all the travel in just two and a half years. In 1992, I began working for Lockheed Martin Skunk Works in Palmdale, California, and I've been there ever since. And that kind of leads to my current work and research, but uh, sorry about that. I guess you did not see. I didn't notice I had some animation there, so you missed that one photo anyway. Before going there, I just wanted to say that a part of my STEM story is that on the personal side, I'm a huge science geek, Star Wars fan, and Disney fan. Yes, that's me with Bill Nye, the science guy in the center there. We spoke together in the same session at the very first Green Schools Conference in Pasadena. Also, of course, I have a big love for nature, which is kind, kind of leads into what I'm doing today. The bulk of my current role at the Skunk Works is managing our sustainable design program. And much of what I'm going to share about uh, the program will come from a presentation I gave for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, who asked me to address the following question. How are aerospace engineers and scientists integrating sustainability considerations and priorities into new product development and business innovation. In this segment, I will provide an overview of our sustainable design program, which seeks innovative, sustainable solutions to the Skunk Works design and technology challenges to both improve product performance and reduce environmental and human health impacts. As some of you may know, the Skunk Works is the front end of Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Company's line of business. We are responsible for new program pursuits, technology development and derivatives, to existing platforms. We, we help customers solve their most difficult challenges to successfully accomplish critical defense missions. Over the past few years, we have won several major new programs which require the development of incredibly challenging materials and technology advancements. 
including hypersonics, next generation air dominance and air mobility, as well as special mission aircraft like the X-59 low boom flight demonstrator for NASA. Because the greatest design opportunities are always material and energy limited, we are having to develop new approaches to innovation that will result in more sustainable solutions and depart from the typical approach to problem solving. Lockheed has, has always maintained a very strong pollution prevention program for the past 20 years. Um, our focus for most of that time was on basic material substitution. For example, removing chromium and toxic solvents from our coatings. In 2018, we re revised our strategy and rebranded the program. The mission of the Sustainable Design Program now is to spark innovative, sustainable solutions to technology, product, and operational challenges to both improve performance and reduce environmental and human health impacts. The Sustainable Design Program focuses on proof of concept seedling projects that have environmental benefits that are aligned with the company's technology roadmap. The Sustainable Design Program projects fall into five basic categories. One, using bio-inspired design and engineered biology to solve key design challenges. Using advanced technology such as plasma, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology focusing on renewable energy technologies and energy density challenges for aircraft, replacing chemical substances that are being restricted by the US and international regulatory agencies. And last, implementing go green projects that focus on reducing waste, water and energy consumption. The Skunk Works has a strong interest in renewable energy technologies such as nuclear fusion. The, <clears throat> we've been working on nuclear fusion for the, for the past uh, five plus years. And we recently broke ground on a 24 megawatt expansion to our one megawatt solar farm. So what is biomimicry or bio-inspired design? Bio-inspired design is an approach to innovation using nature's time-tested structures and functions at every scale, from nano to macro, and at every level, from simple form to ecosystem, to solve engineering challenges. Nature always selects the most material and energy conserving solutions. And from a survival standpoint, nature always makes sustainable use of the periodic table, avoiding elements that are toxic to living systems, thus leading to more sustainable designs. Bio-inspired design can also shorten the product development cycle, for example, from the publication of the first research paper on soft-bodied robotics to the establishment of the first company producing soft robots was less than two years. According to one study over 25, of over 25,000 research papers, as you can see in the graph, Bio-inspired design in the materials and engineering fields has grown exponentially over the past decade. Again, because new design opportunities are always material and energy limited, we believe that learning from nature will open up the design space in many critically important technology threads within Lockheed Martin. Over the past few years, we have brought in the world's leading consultancies and universities to train hundreds of Lockheed Martin engineers and scientists on how to do bio-inspired design. 
<clears throat> we also use them to identify key organisms whose biological functions can inspire important solutions to design challenges in the areas of optics and photonics, aerodynamics, thermal management, and structural materials. And you can see some example species uh, there that um, Professor Jacqueline Noggle from James Madison University in Ohio had uh, provided to us. Although I can't go into a lot of detail regarding our bio-inspired design work, um, I want to show you some examples of the types of projects we are managing and some of the organisms we are taking inspiration from. As you can see here, a wide variety of bio-inspired design studies have been explored, ranging from fungus-based biodegradable materials to aerodynamics work inspired by the owl feather, to optical sensors and structural colors inspired by beetles and butterflies, to lightweight multi-purpose structures inspired by bird bones and the sea sponge. We have seen growing customer interest in several of the bio-inspired design technologies we are working on. Army, Navy, and Air Force customers are particularly enthusiastic about engineered biology and bio-inspired materials. So the next segment is to answer the question, what STEM skills and knowledge do I actively need to be successful in my job as a, a green professional? So behavioral rather than technical competencies distinguish superior from average performance. This according to a, a, the, one of the most famous and largest studies of the um, environmental profession um, that I've ever seen. Success in the environmental role is not just technical, but how the environmental expert communicates his or her expertise to others how the information is framed, and the strategies employed to gain credibility with others. Interpersonal tends to be less important in other technical profession, professions, um, like maybe Professor Lee's, uh, the ones he just talked about. But the environmental profession is unique, complex, and demanding. But starting with technical skills, which are really foundational, I recommend the following courses that you can see on the screen there. The green career field is, is broader than it has ever been, and students can focus in on many different areas these days. Researchers like Dr. James Lehman from uh, 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 I'm forgetting the university he's at actually now. Uh, Dr. Lehman defined 15 cognitive, interpersonal, and intrapersonal behaviors that account for green career professional success. Dr. Lehman also identified three failure behaviors, and these are things like avoiding conflict, using the moral higher ground, and being inflexible all those behaviors lead to poor performance. And these are things you should uh, talk to your students about. Starting with cognitive competencies, problem solving skills are absolutely critical for those entering this field. Identifying the causal relationships, often through the use of a chain of inferences, which is you know, basically inductive reasoning, as well as conceptual thinking, solving problems, or identifying solutions by recognizing and organizing the information into either an existing concept or an invented concept. And that's deductive uh, Sherlock Holmes type reasoning. Information seeking is also very important. Desiring to know more, to seek out and discover all the information. I can't tell you how many times I've made my staff go back and collect additional data. 
because they've, you know, come up with a solution without really understanding everything that's going on. Also, asking many questions, probing for satisfactory answers, and tending to explore not only an individual's thoughts and opinions, but also identifying the facts and distinguishing fact from opinion. These are all important for conducting audits, for doing research, and hazard identification. Finally, planning, using a planning model or a systematic method with, with a planning process uh, creates an organized approach and result in a clear path of action. As previously suggested, behavioral rather than technical competencies distinguish superior from average performance. Success in the environmental role also includes a number of interpersonal competencies. Uh, I'm just highlighting a few of them here, networking, involving others in problem identification, solution generation, and implementation by identifying the right stakeholders to involve and then involving them actively in the process. This is why project management or, or uh, project type uh, work uh, at the student level is critically important to build those skills. Building and maintaining friendly relationships or contacts with people who are or might someday be helpful in achieving work-related goals. Also building a rapport with others, as well as actively pursuing and maintaining a wide breadth of contacts to deepen the effectiveness of his or her network. Um, and then uh, finally for interpersonal um, effective writing, using your ABCs, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Uh, you know, we just don't have time in industry uh, for a lot of fluff. We, we want the answer and we want it stated very simply. Um, and then finally, intrapersonal competencies. These are things that we try to pick up on during the interview process. Uh, achievement orientation, perseverance, self-control, integrity common sense. These are also very important. As Yoda would say, control, you must learn control. Okay, so other advice, uh, know yourself, what you want, what you're good at, be flexible, open to new experiences, expand your computer skills, critically important today, uh, programming, modeling, GIS, uh, you know, that's important for the student to pick up as many computer skills as possible. Uh, keeping up with the latest environmental trends, there's a, a good website I included there. Uh, generalizing uh, is good, but choose a couple areas to really focus on in your student career. Getting certifications, advanced degrees as soon as practical. And then most important, real word world experiences, internships, co-ops, uh, job shadowing. These are all very important uh, things for students to get on their resume. And another thing to keep in mind is the job descriptions for when your students graduate from college haven't even been written yet. So keep an open mind. Okay, so what can teachers do to support students interested in my career field or organization? Start by letting them know green careers are, very, are in very high demand because of expanding global regulations. I mean, you see it on the news every day, right? Growing uh, resource consumption, increasing scrutiny uh, and societal expectations for corporations, uh, chemical liability, and then of course the big one, climate change. Another thing you can highlight for students um, is that uh, the average uh, salary for a, a green career is slightly higher than a lot of other science uh, 
fields and it also is uh, in higher demand as you can see here and in particular sustainability is drawing top dollar and top students from around the country um, and there are lots of uh, programs university programs at uh, the uh, bachelor's and master's and PhD level that um, are now focused on sustainability Finally, another thing you can do is to actually teach biomimicry in the classroom. Most major universities have some sort of biomimicry or bio-inspired engineering course. Um, introducing biomimicry into the classroom bridges the boundaries between school and the real world for students. Biomimicry is an inherently interdisciplinary way of encouraging students to be observant of the complexity of the natural world and our interconnectedness to it. Rather than just to learn about living things, biomimicry requires us to learn from the natural world. Uh, the Biomimicry Institute has been the leader in bio-inspired design information, and their website contains a wealth of information on the subject. And I've, I have a bunch of links that um, you all can have. Um, their YouTube channel has really super excellent quality videos geared to high school students. Um, and they have a partnership with EcoRise to deliver curriculum. Uh, for high school um, students. Uh, it might be junior high as well. I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, nature's strategies challenge chemistry, physics, and biology students to look at nature as a mentor in order to solve sustainability challenges. Um, and one of the key things you can do is to use the Ask Nature tool as a field guide to the natural world. Uh, designed to draw the student's eye to whatever we can learn from nature, not just what we can learn about nature, but learn from them. The Ask Nature site recently received a major overhaul and now consists of four main sections, biological strategy uh, with over 1800 profiles of species, uh, innovations, um, uh, other successes, uh, successful case studies. Uh, now, uh, what's new is educational resources, tools for teachers and students to learn about and begin practicing biomimicry. And then fourth, collections, which are thoughtful essays that identify a theme, trend, or pattern emerging amongst biological strategies. Another thing I would point to is I just got finished judging the Youth Design Challenge. This is put on by the Biomimicry Institute. These are, for, these are teams of high school kids around the world uh, that do hands-on project-based learning uh, that provides uh, classroom and informal educators with engaging, really engaging framework to introduce bio-inspired design and, inter, and that interdisciplinary lens on science engineering and environmental literacy. Um, the picture on the lower left is uh, one of the uh, best done projects by uh, a high school team out of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and they're looking at uh, a, a design inspired uh, from a couple of different species to, <clears throat> to reduce um, damage to estuaries from um, wave action from, you know, violent storms, which are becoming more of the norm because of climate change. And so not only reducing the damage, uh, uh, wave damage, but also providing habitat for, for certain species that live in that area. So that was a really excellent uh, job that they did. Also included a link to the Center for Learning with Nature. Uh, they also have some excellent curriculum for um, K to 12, actually. All right, so last question, um, STEM resources. How am I doing on time? I got just a few minutes left, okay. Uh, <clears throat> 
Okay, so I have a bunch of stuff. Um, all of these you can find on the Lockheed Martin, you know, LockheedMartin.com website. You may be familiar with um, a number of these, um, and Lockheed participates in all of them. Uh, I would highlight CodeQuest, um, a computer programming competition that put high school students' coding skills to the test, um, and uh, also would would highlight engineers in the classroom. Every February is engineers month and uh, we send uh, engineers out into the classrooms to mentor and, and give uh, kids advice on careers in the STEM fields. Um, First Robotics is a great program. There's, there's uh, in the Antelope Valley and Santa Clarita Valley, uh, those robotics teams do excellent work and are very competitive. Um, so the link to the corporate Lockheed Martin website is here. We also have a, a neat uh, career predictor, um, which is pictured here um, and the links here. Um, you know, you answer a bunch of questions and, and the computer will tell you what kind of career might be of interest to, you, to your students. Uh, Kimberly, how am I doing on time? I have 5.20 as my stop. Uh, um, yeah, we got a couple more minutes. Sorry, that's my bad. I was stopped paying attention to the time because I was very interested in your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, I'll go for, I think I got like maybe five minutes left here. So I'll uh, try to quickly go through this, um, the rest of the content. So. Um, STEM outreach. Um, we do a lot locally in, in the areas in which Lockheed Martin um, has facilities. So for example, Marie Weber, who's I think on, on, on the line here uh, in there's Lockheed Martin facilities in her area in Maryland and uh, they do a lot of STEM outreach there. And then for us at the Skunk Works, we do a lot of outreach to the Antelope Valley Palmdale Lancaster, as well as the Santa Clarita Valley, where we also have some facilities. We support a couple of nonprofits there, and they do a lot of green career type um, and environmental um, education. Things like for Meek, uh, the Enviro Bus Bucks, where they sponsor a, a bus, pay for a bus so that your class can go visit some environmentally themed area or visited an industrial site and see what they're doing to prevent pollution. Mini grants, both Meek and Seek uh, offer teacher mini grants. And uh, so the, the curriculum I talked about um, that's available from Biomimicry Institute, for example, it's 250 bucks. Well, that would be a perfect mini grant for a teacher and you can apply on, on these websites. We have a number of annual events and contests for Meek and Seek. Um, we do scholarships. Um, and then the big one for, for me is Green STEM Summit, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, also, I have, um, because of COVID, I, I uh, had our team put together um, some virtual jobs shadowing videos um, that are on different green careers like air an air quality specialist or hazardous material specialist and so on. If you're looking for a quick five or six minute video, these are all publicly um, releasable. Um, just shoot me an email and uh, uh, we can uh, coordinate on getting, uh, providing those videos for you to use in your classroom. And we, and we do uh, other thing, well, uh, like uh, Valencia High School's nanoscience poster competition. And we, we just, we do other things that I don't have time to mention. But the, here's the list of the different topics um, uh, for virtual job shadowing. This is the Green STEM Summit. This, this is held every October. And we invite, uh, last year we had 90 STEM professionals, uh, a majority female. Um, you know, uh, more than a third were PhDs from industry, academia, government, and they talked about uh, natural and physical sciences, biomimicry, engineering, environmental, advanced manufacturing. 
a whole bunch of things. Uh, you can see the student responses. Um, it went over very well. Um, and it's doing its job um, inspiring STEM careers. And just a couple of charts to show you the kinds of 15 minute presentations that were done. Quite a variety of, of STEM topics. Uh, the theme being, you know, uh, using STEM to make a greener world. Well, there's two pages to it and, and students can, couldn't pick and choose. And the videos from all of these from last year are available on the SEEK website. That's my story. That's my STEM story, I should say. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we have, uh, we do have some questions. Um, but first, and I mentioned this to Marie is, so I've actually, I've actually seen like, I think you're the at least fifth Lockheed Martin presentation I've seen this year. Um, and I got us, and I'm just really enjoying the diversity of presentations, you know, so we had you, we've had someone talk about lasers, cybersecurity, Marie talked about uh, systems engineering, uh, and we actually, we ended up did have an aerospace engineer talk about helicopters for a bit, but I mean, I'm just really, it's Lockheed Martin just does so much stuff, more of a comment from my side. And then, so for a couple of questions, one question we have is, I guess someone was interested in, um, do any of those STEM grants reach down to like the Long Beach Unified School District? If you go to, well, uh, some of the the local ones don't but um if you if you are looking for funds for something in the la area go to the lockheedmartin.com website and and then uh, under stem activities um you can click on cyber grants and 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 you can apply for a grant that way awesome thank you so much and then all right let's see what we got for other questions and i guess so What's your favorite, I guess, like biomimicry that you've seen at Lockheed Martin? Oh, that's a good question. I would say my favorite is just because of the species itself, the work we did to reduce propeller noise for unmanned aerial vehicles inspired by the uh, owl feathers. Uh, the, 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 both the leading edge and trailing edge of an owl, uh, of an owl's wing has little tiny vortices that um, create, or little tiny, I, I guess, um, little triangles, I would say, that create vortices in the air that reduce drag. And they also reduce sound levels. So if you've ever seen an owl in flight, you don't hear them. <laughs> no. Just the work we did to reduce propeller noise was, was probably my favorite project. Oh, that's really interesting. I did see it on the chart and I was like, I wonder how that works. <laughs> in terms of how do you see, um, now you, you mentioned kind of like the problem solving critical thinking skills. How do you see that playing out in your work? Uh, well, every day is a challenge in this, in the environmental field. If you're working for uh, industry, if you're working for government, if you're working in academia, uh, doing research, I mean, every day is a challenge and every day you're, you, you're faced with a new problem. And just having a good set of problem solving skills is just really important. In, uh, in industry, we, we do root cause analysis training for our employees so that they can, you know, get to the root cause of, of whatever problem they're dealing with. And so it's just something you've got to have in your toolbox to, to do a good job. Because like I said, every, every day there's a new problem <laughs> you got to go figure out. So. I guess along that theme, then, what was your what was the your most favorite problem you saw, you've solved? Well, the biggest challenge for me was you know three is kind of related to my STEM story, and and that's like uh, four years ago, my boss said you need to go figure out a way to make engineers and scientists think sustainability and think about the environment when they're designing new products. So, you know, how do I go do that? I mean, you know, the younger generations are pretty much, you know, they grew up on recycling and all that. So they're pretty enthusiastic, but how do you teach those old dogs new tricks? 
So when I found out about biomimicry, it was like, aha, it was like my aha moment, like, um, here's something that everybody loves, you know, nature and organisms and, you know, what they do. And, and maybe not only can we, like, uh, uh, imitate nature to make us more sustainable, but can nature teach us to solve some of these incredible challenges that we have technology wise and so it caught on like wildfire at at our company and it was a way to to really change the culture at our facility that's oh. kind of the biggest problem <laughs> no but that's super interesting yeah. um, and it's funny because i was on um well i was on the internet earlier today and i saw someone had posted a picture and it was something, it was, it was about how nature is all about efficiency. Um, yeah, yeah. Serendipitous that, you, that I saw, <laughs> to see this presentation today.